His name was Geralt of Rivia. He was a witcher, a professional monster slayer. An unusual contract to lift the curse that held a monarch's daughter. It was enough to spend the night with the princess, dusk till dawn. If only she were not Currently, The Witcher is one of the biggest names in video games, with The Witcher 3 selling millions upon millions of copies and setting a new standard for open-world RPG games. Well, mainstream ones that aren't gothic, but you get the idea. And yet, when someone asks, where should I begin this series, people generally tell them to skip the first one. Now, they may do this because they're planning on playing it on a console and there is no console version of The Witcher 1. There was an attempt to make it, but that sort of evolved into The Witcher 2. There were some problems with funding back then. And some would say to not play it because it's not worth it. It's just too old, too antiquated. It's nothing like the others. And indeed, it's nothing like the others. But that doesn't mean it should be avoided, and I'm here to tell you why. But first, let's begin with what The Witcher is. It began life in a far, faraway land, Poland to be exact, in the writings of a fantasy author named Andrzej Sapkowski, and that's probably not his exact name. The books were very popular in Poland, so much so that they made a movie out of them. Well, they made a TV series slash movie out of them, and it was horrible. It, I've seen it. It's not good. But there is much love, much passion for adapting this series that wasn't actually called The Witcher. It was called Wisdom, and the movie was called Hexer, and there was a proposal to call it Warlock. And somewhere around that time, or I believe earlier, actually 97, 98 or something, there was an attempt to actually make The Witcher into a video game. It never made it to fruition, though there are still bits and pieces of it, images mostly articles, scattered throughout the internet that show what it would have looked like. It doesn't bear much resemblance to the current Witcher games. It was made in a different time by different people with different technology. It wasn't made by CD Projekt. Now let's take a moment to talk a bit about CD Projekt 2. The thing you have to understand is that this is a company from Eastern Europe and there is a different way that companies from Eastern Europe function than ones from regular Europe, you know? Because being from Eastern Europe, you are absolutely ignored by everyone. Or at least that's how it used to be. If you wanted to buy a video game, well, no one was importing them. No one was selling them. You had to bring them into the country yourself, and that's what CD Projekt did. Initially, they didn't do it legally, but they stepped up and actually started importing games, translating them, making localized version, and fostering an actual gaming community in Poland. You know, something that never happened to Romania, no matter how many people have tried. And I'm not talking about myself this time, it's actually something that's quite sad to see the efforts of so many be thrown away repeatedly. But back to CD Projekt. Around 2002, they acquired the rights for The Witcher. If I'm not mistaken, they were actually the ones that gave it a name. And at that time, there was still a company that imported and localized video games. They were not a game developer. And when they began work on The Witcher, they were still not a game developer, reason for which the development took quite some time, posed many issues, and it was a learning experience for everyone involved. They learned how to plan the production of a game, how to code one, how to deal with all the mess that's associated with video games. And they had a playable version of a Witcher game around the same year that they bought the uh, rights for it, 2002. And they shopped that version around to different companies and try to actually get a publishing deal. That didn't work out so well. So they started again with the same concepts, the same ideas. Back then you didn't play Geralt, you played your own Witcher, the one you could customize. And because they were using the Aurora engine which they had licensed from Bioware, they shared a booth at E3. Well, they had a little square room with one monitor, a chair, and a curtain. And that's where people first saw the Witcher. Well, again, a Witcher. The one you're seeing on the background. Bits of it are in the final game. What's important to note here is that this game was built on the same technology as Neverwinter Nights. 
and yet it doesn't look like that kind of game. It doesn't look like a tile-based game where everything looks kind of the same. It looks more real, well not realistic, more believable. And that's because they spent quite a lot of time working on improving the engine as best they could. They even tried to make the combat not absolutely boring like Neverwinter Nights had. After all, even in that game you had a companion, so there were two characters to boss around. Here you would only have one, and Neverwinter Nights core gameplay mechanics applied to a single character, that would have been horrible. So instead they chose to well, still use the same kind of click to attack things gameplay like you see in many RPGs, but they added a mechanic that they believe would liven things up. It is inspired a bit by a mechanic that was also present in the game Summoner. The idea is that you click on an enemy to attack it, and then to chain a more powerful attack you have to click at the right time. Now people have said that this is basically quick time events and it's horrible. I'm not saying it's great, but it's sort of a more in control version of the Arkham system. Only instead of mashing a button at the right time and seeing your character wildly flying in different directions that you didn't even choose, here you actually chose what enemy to attack and you click the mouse button instead of pressing a control button or even a mouse button because you can play Arkham on your mouse and keyboard. Combat was without a doubt the weakest part of, well, one of the weakest parts of the game. But it wasn't horrible, it wasn't bad, it was just not as good as it could have been. Though that can be said for every Witcher game, none of their combat systems were as good as they could have been. The Witcher was finally released with Geralt as a main character in the year 2007. It was one of the worst releases of the time. In terms of technical issues, that is. The game ran poorly, it had a lot of bugs, it had a lot of problems, and it sort of showed that it was made by people that did not have infinite resources or necessarily were masters of their field yet. Now in most cases that would have been it. They would have launched a rushed version of the game when it was still filled with bugs, call it a day, disbanded, maybe make a sequel when people forgot about the original, you know the Joe would approach. Instead of being lazy, CD Projekt got to work and over the course of a year improved the game massively. Not just fixing technical issues but also fixing the translation, fixing Fixing character motivation, fixing the voiceover. Voice work in The Witcher 3 is superb. It's amazing. The first one, even though it had some of the same voice actors, for example, Doc Cockle was still Geralt, the quality wasn't as good as it was in the Enhanced Edition or as in the later games. Though I have to say that the Witcher 1 Triss is the best Triss, and I'm gonna get into details why soon. But they improved everything. They made The Witcher Enhanced Edition. They even bundled an editor with the game so people could make their own adventures. And they did. And the game sold quite well. In a time where people were saying that PC is dead, here were a bunch of people from Poland making a PC RPG in a time when Mass Effect was the hottest thing, when Dragon Age was knocking at the door. They made The Witcher 1 and it was a success. Do you want to know why it was a success? Because it was different. This was not a world of fairy tales. Well, yeah, it was a world of fairy tales, but it was a world of fairy tales in a realistic approach. It was a dark, depressing world that's inspired by the pain and suffering of everyone living in Eastern Europe, especially Poland again, because it's, it's a Polish thing. Even the main menu of the game was a rainy, overcast sky with ravens flying around and a desolate depressing, dull village devoid of color. It set the mood right there and then. That's the world you would traverse. That's your fairy tale. That's a world where elves are hunted to extinction, where they're treated as slaves, as secondhand people, dwarfs too, you know, all the stuff that Dragon Age stole and its ideas. That's a world where monsters aren't just the ones with fangs and claws and teeth. They're the ones who do evil because it suits them, who would harm others because it's in their advantage. It's not a world of good versus evil. It's a world where there are very few things still sacred left, still wholly good. It's mostly about choosing the lesser evil. And that's where the witchers come in. Monster hunters. Those who walk the path choosing the lesser evil each time and hoping they got it right. That was the world of the books 
And that's how they translated it in the video games, especially in this one, in The Witcher 1. They got it right on the first go. Not just thematically, but visually and auditively as well. When you walked at nights on the outskirts of Izima, you felt an oppressive dark gloom just lurking beneath the shadows. You also got to see probably the most beautiful night scene in any Witcher game because the moon wasn't gigantic and also you could see it for more than five minutes, though the moon itself didn't actually cast the correct light to render you a shadow, the light was coming from a cloud somewhere for some reason. And that darkness, that, that absolute gloom, that depressing dread that you would encounter in the beginning in the first chapters, that was completely offset by the second part where you would be transported to a dreamy lakeside region with golden fields, with bright blue skies, with warmth, with color, with life and with tragedy. I don't have my own captures from that area of the game because I don't have save games for that part and I would need about 12 hours to get to that part of the game if I started it again, so I'm probably gonna splice in someone else's gameplay. And each region you would visit would have a different feel to it. A bustling city that kinda looks small compared to the days Novigrad or even Oxenfurt, a ruined city in a siege, and in the end, the Ice Fortress. Sort of a taste of what you got in The Witcher 3 when you traversed the plains, which I hope is not a spoiler, but Geralt gets to do some sightseeing in Witcher 3, like he did in the first one too. And all along your adventure you would have choices. Choices that aren't completely obvious, they aren't the kind of choices that you would see in a Bioware game that says do good or do evil. No, they were, am I gonna protect the person that sold someone poison to murder their brother? Or am I gonna protect that person from the murderer? Am I going to take pity upon a monstrous werewolf that stalks the night murdering people, evil people, bad people? And it also gave you a question that was really unexpected. How do I raise a child? Who do I raise it with? Do I give that child a home with someone who will love him? Or do I try and make him understand that he has different abilities that require a certain level of discipline that may not conform to actually having a loving family? And what do I do when all the choices I've made come clashing one on top of each other, forcing me to take a side, forcing me to choose between two sides that I do not agree with? Hence, The Witcher Neutrality. The game was filled with memorable characters. Some of them are taken from the books, some of them are made up, well even the ones from the books are sort of changed quite a lot. And one that really stood out for me was Triss. The Witcher 1 Triss. She is not like her other incarnations. The closest that we got in the other Witcher games to Witcher 1 Triss is Yennefer. Witcher 2 and Witcher 3 Triss is a loving soul with a calm, caring voice. Witcher 1 Triss wasn't. She she was way more demanding. She wouldn't ask, she would give orders. She was Yennefer from The Witcher 3. And in terms of design, she was Oriana from the uh, Blood and Wine expansion. And I mean literally, she had the exact same model, the exact same appearance as her. It was actually shocking to see her in The Witcher 3 and wonder well, uh, what's going on. She also never got naked for Playboy in The Witcher 1. Now, the game is lambasted because it portrays feminine frivolity as being something, accessibility, men, sexism stuff. Yeah, you, you had the collectible cards, which were corny as hell. I get it, some people may be offended by them. But the actual idea of there being this superhero in a medieval age, an infertile, incapable of having disease superhero going around town courting ladies. Yeah, I, I don't actually believe that the idea that women would want to sleep with him constantly was out of place. Especially since they fixed the translation because words did not mean what they meant in the original version. You would ask Triss, shall we sit, and they went on to do the nasty, but they did fix that in the end. The Witcher 1 also had a somewhat atypical story. It was launched at a time where if you had a character who suffered from amnesia, you just knew the story would be about their amnesia. The story would be, oh, how they lost their memory and they're gonna get it back by the end and it turns out that they actually had something to do with a big villain that's threatening everybody and it's somehow their fault and it's some way related. The Witcher did not do any of that. The plot of The Witcher 1 and Geralt's amnesia are not related. It's something that comes out of left field and breaks the cliche, though to be fair, 
kind of games with amnesia well some of them in the old days they used to be quite well done in terms of story and the witcher is no exception it just deviates from the norm what the story is well that's actually kind of complicated it starts with a murder with a revenge continues with a threat that looms upon the world itself a threat that isn't dealt with technically until the last game, until The Witcher 3, where it's done kind of pushed. And all throughout the story, across the main plot, you would have opportunities to explore what happened to Geralt. And you could completely miss things, you could absolutely completely glance over the fact that there's a second story in there, the fact that there's a wild hunt, that there is creatures about that are hunting you. And again, that you would only get to truly, truly face off with in the third one which again because kind of lackluster I kind of expected a bit more of an oomph to it not that the endings of the witcher games were bad well the second one had probably kind of the weakest ending the second one also had kind of the weakest graphics i'm getting a bit back to the um the way that game looked the witcher one may have used simple graphics banal by today's standard but they looked amazing they looked stylistically incredible i mentioned the contrast between the pressing outskirts of izima and the idyllic lakeside the way the lakeside looked just the way the water reflected the light the, the colors that area of the game looks better than anything in the witcher 2 and the witcher 2 uses much more advanced graphics much more advanced technology but the lighting is horrid and stylistically in places it looks just atrocious but back to the story there may be a spoiler in here somewhere but uh, it's something that has to be said the witcher 1 is filled with great moments, it's filled with great quotes, it's filled with fantastic scenes. And in my opinion, the best one comes right near the end, when you've defeated your final foe and you're drawing your sword to kill them, if, if you made a certain choice. There is a moment there where the enemy looks up at you as you're grabbing your silver sword and says, but, but but that sword is for monsters. And in that moment, they get it. Now that scene has absolutely no value to it in the original version because the, the voice acting was just horrible. But in the enhanced edition, that scene is amazing because you're dealing here with, with an enemy that did not see themselves as a villain, did not see themselves as a monster. They saw themselves as the savior, as the person doing what needed to be done to save everyone from the oncoming darkness. But their methods were monstrous and a witcher kills monsters no matter what they look like. This show sort of came out a bit longer than I wanted to. I intended to be a bit more succinct, so I'm just gonna cram in that the end the fact that the witcher one had the best inventory of the series even though the inventory in the witcher one before the enhanced edition was the worst one possible it's still better than the witcher 2 and in some ways better than the witcher 3 also it's the only game where the cat potion was actually useful and looked good i'm not actually sure if i convinced you to play this game it is a lengthy time invest i mean i finished it twice must have spent about 80 hours in it the second time i mean the first one by probably Probably finish it faster because I didn't do everything. But I can assure you that if you can get past its combat system, which again isn't great, but you won't have Geralt flying like an animal a thousand feet away when you click once, like in later games, when you try to hit the enemy that's right next to you, and the fact that you can't jump, which is again something akin to what The Witcher 2 had, but the map design isn't as bad. In the swamp, it's it's kind of tedious, but the rest of the game is fine. You'll find here a game filled with atmosphere, like probably one of the best atmospheres in the series. The Witcher 2, by the way, sucked when it came to atmosphere completely. Absolutely, it, it was just terrible. And The Witcher 3 was closer to The Witcher 1. You'll have a good story here, you'll have good characters, you'll have a development of a world that is superb to explore. And you'll get to meet some very interesting characters, talk to them, tell jokes, and rate an old lady's pantry looking for some pickles. Not because you're robbing her house like you do with everybody's house in The Witcher 3, but because you were having a party. Also, Geralt drunk at parties in The Witcher 1 is amazing, it's the best thing ever. So give it a go, you will not regret it. CD Projekt certainly did not regret it, and neither do I. Goodbye.